title of the sermon is here, You Will Show Me the Path of Life. So we continue our, our study on, on our journey to our heavenly home, and this is our title, You Will Show Me the Path of Life. Let me give you a quote and think about, about this quote. People take different roads seeking fulfillment and happiness. Is that true? Hello? Did you hear? People take different roads seeking fulfillment and happiness. But just because they are not on your road doesn't mean that they have gotten lost. Because they are not on your road, it doesn't mean that they are lost. Do you agree with that statement? Maybe with the first part. Maybe not with the second part. I repeat, pay attention. People take different roads seeking fulfillment, seeking happiness. But just because they are not on your road, do you know what the road you're on? Because they're not on your road doesn't mean they have gotten lost. Is, is that right or not right? Not right. Thank you, Brother Stephen. The first sentence certainly is true. People do take different road. But according to what we have looked at last week, there's a narrow gate. And there is a, a, a narrow, constricted, and hard road that leads to life. And only few find it. Is that right? Yes. We read it last week. We, we looked at it quite in detail. So the second part of that sentence, and then should, according to the words of Jesus, should not be true. Just because they are not on your road doesn't mean that they have gotten lost. If they are not, there's only two roads. And for David, David is convinced that there is one path only that will lead to life. And he is convinced that his God will show him this path and will keep him on this path. So I hope that you have this, this conviction. Go to slide number two. You cause me to know the path of life, and your presence is joyful abundance. At your right hand there are pleasures forever. And we could read from different Bibles uh, versions, show me the path that leads to life. Your presence fills me with joy and brings me pleasure forever, or the pleasures of living with you forever. And I want to, to, to stress that, that's, that verse here because it's very important. Because David is sure that he is not going to miss this path. And this is, there is one way to live for God. There is one path. And last week we saw the words of Jesus. There is a narrow road. And not many finds it. But there is a wide road. And most people take this road. But David says, no, me, I find there is one path. There is one way. There is one life worth living. There is one way. There is one path. And God is going to show me. And in this path, I will find everything that I need. I will stick close to the Lord. And in this path, that's, that's the secret. I will stick close to the Lord. And your presence at your right hand. At your right hand. Like you can touch his hand. You can hold his hands. You are on the right hand. It's like going to a marriage and you, 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 you're the bride. You, you, you're holding the, the arms of your, of your bridegroom. Or you are the best man and you are on the right side. It's, it's the place of honor. It's a place of privilege. And there, there is fullness of pleasures. There is joy there. So look at yourself and your life. Is there, do you find this one? Are you that close to the Lord that you find this sense of contentment in your life? Because David says, this is where I find it. This is how I find it. If I'm not that close to God, maybe I will fall into different uh, you know, emotions, different state of mind. Maybe I lose my joy or something. But here it says, pleasure is forevermore. And that expression, pleasure forevermore, means perpetually. That's the idea of that. Forever more. Forever. Perpetually. Forever and more. And eternal progressions. Think of the duration in the most extended and unlimited manner. Eternity. Think about it. Forever and more. Put it to the most, but then there is more. And that, that is what God has for us. So in that 
when you approach God, when you walk daily and this path so close to God, this is what you get from God. You get more than what you need. You, you get to satisfy yourself. There is still more, forever and more. So David wants to be sure that he's not going to miss any of these blessings of living near God. So he prays God in another psalm. You can click not to let him go on the wrong way. And he has to be corrected and brought back if ever he would lose his way. Examine me, God, and know my mind. Test me. Know my thoughts. What's going on in me, in my mind, in my motives, in my, in my research, in my journey? See if there is any offensive tendency. And I like this, this translation here. Tendency means you, you, you tend. You tend. You, you, you are going a bit out. You are losing the focus. You have some tendency this way, tendency that way, tendency to the wide road, tendency to certain pleasure, certain passion. So see if there is some, any offensive tendency in me and lead me in the eternal way. Anything in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. That's a prayer that you and I need to pray often and keep our eyes tackled on that one because that's important. Imagine, if there is only two destinations and two roads for every human being, you want to be on the right one. And isn't it the role of the church, the pastors, the Bible teachers, to repeat it again to your memory, keep you into thinking and correcting in the same way, so that the Word of God, according to Paul and Timothy, says it is inspired of God and useful for teaching, but also for correcting, for rebuking, and for preparing us to live that way. So that, that, that says the same thing in different ways. Lord, test me, check me out. Don't, don't allow me to, to go according to my tendency. Because you, we know, we know ourselves. We know we are filled with all sorts of tendencies. I don't know if you agree with that, but I look at myself. It's easy to go this way, that way, and to think in wrong, and you know, and to, to let our passions, our impulse, or our desire, our vain glory, or our pride, or whatever it is, lead us to this way or that way. So David wants to be sure, Lord, you will show me the path, and Lord, if ever I go out of it. Please correct me, bring me back to that path. The Word of God is useful for this one. And I want to go back to uh, our text from last week because uh, I have not finished. I, I had planned today to move on to another text, but as I was preparing, it always bring me back to last week's text. So I want to go back, go to the next uh, slide. This is the text that we were uh, looking at uh, in details last week. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad and easy is the road that leads to destructions and eternal loss. And there are many who enter in through it, but small is the gate, and narrow and constricted, difficult is the road that leads to everlasting life. And there are few who find it. Wow, that's, that's, that's really a big deal. So I want to look at the next slide, because that's a bit a summary of what we were talking about. We were describing the narrow gate and the narrow road, the white gate and the white God. And I was tricking you and asking you last week, what should be a sign that would describe? And many of you agree that here should be to destructions because it says that, in fact, it leads to destruction. But the, the deception in this way is that both signs show to heaven. So that, that's what the false prophets and the false teachers and Satan and, and the, the pleasure of this world wants to tell us. You don't need to live a life of discipleship, a life of sacrifice, a life where it is narrow on you and you make choices that are difficult and that you will accept to live with perseverance and patience. You can live and still go to heaven if you, if you go in this way. So we looked at it uh, uh, last week. And uh, if you click the next one, just following the next verse, says, beware of false prophets who come disguised as armless. They, these guys, they look like armless. They're just nice people. They're just talking, sharing. You know, they are intelligent, 
They are logical and they know how to, how to speak. Very eloquent. And they can convince anybody. They have good arguments. They have human philosophies. They know how to convince you that, you know, you can go to heaven also in this way. But they are vicious wolves. That is what they are, in fact. Because anybody that will cause an individual, man or woman or child, to go to destruction has to be a wolf. Do you agree with that? It's not somebody that acts with love. Either he's totally deceived or his motives are totally wrong. Hallelujah. So Jesus makes it clear that the right, the right road is found only through the narrow gate. And this is where the journey begins. And that's another theme that I want to bring today. Because many times when you were preached the gospel, and I was preached the gospel, I remember, Re believe in Jesus, repent, you get saved, and that's it. Your sins are forgiven, and that's it. It's almost giving us the impression that when the day you are born again, you arrived. You, you, this is the destination. You, you, you got it. That's, that's the goal. You got saved. Yay. Okay. But if you look at the words of Jesus, that's not, don't say yay right now. It's good. That's happening. It's true. But it is the beginning of a journey. It is just the beginning of the journey. Small is the gate and narrow and constricted and difficult is the road that leads to everlasting life. And there are few who find it. Now, I want to pay attention to that part where, where it will say that only a few will find it. Because this point right there caused some difficulties to many people, to non-believers alike, about the goodness of God. Why? Why? If God is love, if God is good, why is it that it is so hard to get saved? Why is it so, so few that will find the gate? Why didn't God make it so easy and everybody come to my heaven? I'm a God of love and I will save you. So that's the, the understanding that many people in the world have. It's like, it's like unfair. It sounds like, like unfair. Why didn't God make it easier to be saved? So I want to show you in chapter 7, a bit earlier, in verse 7 and 8 in the next slide. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, it will be open. So that is a wonderful text because that text in the same chapter is telling us that it is easy to get saved, that salvation is offered to everyone. The, the call to find the life of God is open. Anyone who asks, anyone who seeks, anyone who knocks, Knox means also perseverant and, uh, you know, striving and they really wanted it. And it says in Jeremiah, if you seek with all of your heart, I will let you find me. So the invitation of God is open. So even though it says it's narrow, it's not because, if so I'm just answering that argument. Why people are thinking maybe it's, not un it's unfair. Why God made, didn't make it easy? God already invites. God already says, anybody... Everyone, everyone can find, find life, okay? And that text continued that uh, with, with a comparison with the fathers of this world. If the son is hungry, will, will, instead of bread, will he give him a stone? Okay? Will he give him a fish or a snake? And then it says, if evil like you are, how much more, then we can click, how much more, Will your Father who is in heaven give good things? Like, is there a way not to show this, this last one here? Yeah. Who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? So your heavenly Father is not restraining or unfair when He says the narrow gate is not about God blocking the way or being selective. That's not what it means. I'm just answering this argument. Because your heavenly Father, how much more? Will he give good things to those who ask? That's, that's the heart of the Father. It's always been. He's generous. He's open. He invites to salvation and to the path of life. So Jesus wants to make it clear 
in that sense that the path to eternal life is open to anyone is anyone but it is narrow in the sense as we have discussed last week because of the requirement to enter because there's only one way to enter to that gate last week we also explained that the way narohi, the word narohi means obstacle that stands in the ways. And we discussed that in details last week. But it's also the, uh, talking about mainly the requirement that I want to bring today. The narrow gate leads to a hard road. And it will take us through hardship and difficult decision. See, the gate is narrow and the life after that is not going to be easy. That's what Jesus is telling us right to begin. Following Jesus will require crucifying the flesh. It will require living by faith, not by sight, making decisions that sometimes will, be, will necessitate a great effort of trust in God. It, following Jesus means enduring trials with Christ, like patience. It will not be easy. We have many of our brothers and sisters who are being persecuted and in prisons and, and they are put to death today in this world. And many of our lives, we are called. When I was, I was talking to you about Pilgrim's Progress last week, uh, since I am listening to, to this wonderful uh, uh, parable or metaphor, the Christian life. And uh, at one point where I was listening this week, Pilgrim's, his name is Christian, as received at the house of the beautiful, as received the, the, the armor of the, of the Christians to protections. Then he meets Apollyon. Apollyon means destructor, which represents Satan on the way he's continuing his journey. He meets Satan. And Satan is accusing him and he's sending fire against him and, and he is really ugly and big and fierce and he proclaims that he is the Lord of this land and that Christian belongs to him and that he is unfit and unworthy to go to heaven and uh, they, they, they have, they, they, they have to, to, fight, uh, to fight here and one of the accusation that Apollyon brings to Christian says w w you belong to me you're better with me and, and uh, Christian is telling him well your wages are not good for me your wages is death so he says, I prefer the wages of glory that is awaiting me by the Lord of the, of the hill, like the Jesus. And then what happened is that uh, the devil says, okay, if you want better wages, I will give you everything you want. It just, just like the same as the temptation of, of, uh, of, of Jesus, just like the temptation. So he's saying like if you if you come with me if you come back to to live with me i will give you everything you want he says no i i, I don't want to blah 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 so yeah, i'm going on and then he's he's accusing him he's uh, accusing him look the wages of your lord is not much better because look many of them they follow him and they have to give their life and he's not delivering them and they go to prison and they die and your Lord is not helping them and then Christian answered them and he says it's because he is testing their faith so anyway th there's more into that that conversation but Satan is really accusing God and he's accusing himself bringing his past mistakes and trying to discourage him but living as a Christian you will have to endure all sorts of trials with patience and perseverance so that is something that is difficult and also following Christ means living a lifestyle that is separate from the world separate from the world so we don't live in the same way as the world we have different codes of conduct we have a different sense of moralities we make choices because of what we have chosen to follow uh, Jesus Christ so let me ask you a question if you're driving a car and you come to a road a road course both roads leads to the same destination one is a bumpy dirt road and the other one is a well-paved road straight and easy to go which one will you choose 
Of course, uh, it's easy to answer that question. So human nature always gravitates toward comfort and pleasure. But Jesus never sugarcoated is the price, the cost, the way, the message. He never did that. And not many people are willing to pay the price to follow him. So that is in that sense that the road is narrow. It's not God who make a selection. It's the people who make choices of not wanting to pay the price and finding this narrow road. God offers salvation to everyone who accepts it. Let's click the next one here. And you know this, this scripture is very well. However, to all who received him, those believing in his name, he gave authority to become God's children. Again, you look at this text. To all who believe, to all who receive, who accept him. It's not only to a few. So the way to eternal life, the way to life is open. Let's talk a bit about salvation because it's so important. You know that God is holy. He is merciful, He is just. And if He is just, justice requires that sin will be paid for. If you and I, we look back at our lives, standing in front of the holiness and the righteousness of God makes us, as it is described in Isaiah, like filthy rags. Our righteousness, the best that we have to offer to God, compared to his perfection and his righteous standards, is like filth, filth dirt. It's, it's not acceptable. It's really not acceptable. So that's why Jesus paid a great cost, at great cost to save you. Without the blood of Jesus to cover your sin and take away your sin, there would be no way to life. There would be no narrow gate, no narrow way. There would be no way, just a way to judgment and to destructions and eternal. So think about that. Now there is a narrow way because this narrow way is open for all, but this narrow way says, listen, in view of the Holy God, in view of the filth of our sin, there is only one way to enter into this gate. So this narrow way, this narrow gate, it's not about God selecting, it's about the way to enter, there is only one way to enter, and it is through repenting, and it is through believing in Jesus only for salvation, not through man-made religions, not through philosophies, not through man's self-effort, not through man's goodness, not to good deeds, not anything. There's only this narrow way to enter, and Jesus is the, the way to enter. Entering the narrow gate is difficult. Because we live in a self-centered, sin-saturated world and there are many who will not desire Jesus enough to come to Him in this turn. We are comfortable in our self-centered world. We are comfortable in this wide, broad road, sin-saturated world. And not many people want to find this narrow gate to follow Jesus if it's going to cost you more a price to you understand so that's why the way and the road is narrow so this is what this is how we can see that it was with sorrow it was with sorrow and with tears that jesus says that the road to eternal life is narrow and only a few will find it it's not like just only a few i have decided that only a few no the call to life is from God's Father, Father, and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Everyone is well welcome in. Actually, you read in the Gospel of Luke that he is sending his servant. Go on the highways. Go on the small road. Go everywhere and invite, constrain everyone to come to the wedding of the King's sons. He is sending his, his servant to, to track down and to invite people. But they were not willing. You remember that, that parable? Some says, oh, sorry, I just got married. Oh, sorry, I just bought a land. Oh, just, I just bought some, uh, uh, some um, 
Carabao, and I'm going to my, you know, in my rice field or something. So, so that, that's that's what he said. People excuse themselves, and the king was was angry because they refused his honor, they refused his invitation. So that's in that sense that narrow. It's not because God is unfair. It's because God. People make choices. People make choices, and and this is this is uh, in this way. You know, in the Pilgrim's Progress, another conversation, they're asking Pilgrims, why are you traveling alone? Uh, don't you have a family where you're coming from? Yes. And then he starts crying, then he explained that he has, because when he was reading the book, and he read that there was a rat, that the city was going to be destroyed, he shared with his wife that he loved, and he shared with his children, and he pleaded with them over and over again, and he repeated them, he let them read the, the, the words of the book that he was so troubled with. They refused to go. They mocked him, they opposed him, they refused to go. So the narrow road is, is like that. People are invited to it. It's hard to find because people don't want to find, to find it. You understand that? Our Christian life is, is a journey, not a destination. You know, like just in the same way as the people of Israel were freed from Egypt, and then they were led on a journey through the wilderness to find, to reach to the promised lands. That is the picture that we read, and so many books of the Bible refer to that to explain what Christian life is all about. This is one of the best illustration of what our journey to heaven is compared with. We have so many comparisons in both the Old Testament and New Testament, reminders, warnings, encouragement, promise, don't be like them, or you know, like, just, just go in this way. So in the same way, our Christian life is a journey, a process. We haven't arrived yet, we must continually press on. An example of that we could see is the, the Church of Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. This is a very good church. If you look at this church, this is a very good church. Jesus commands this church very well. They are all doing the, the right things. They are involved in the right things. They, I know your works. You have done more works than you used to. You're doing all that. You're doing this. You're doing that. That's really good. But one thing that I have against you, you have forsaken your first love. So here again, there's a great truth about that. Christian life, was becoming to them more about doing things than about Jesus. Remember last week I said heaven is heaven because of Jesus. Heaven is heaven not because of the street of gold and not because of the, the big stones that are the, all the doors are the big stones and you know the look and the, and the tree, trees of, of, for healings and the rivers. These things are added benefits. It's part of the generosity of God. But heaven is heaven because God is there. Heaven is heaven because Jesus is there. Heaven is heaven because we will be with Jesus that saved us. For this. So, so that is something we need to bring back to us all the time. So how is your connection to Jesus, your love to Jesus? They were asking pilgrims in this journey, so why did you go on this journey? Is, you know, and then he says uh, because of the destructions and he wants to do that. So is there other re reason? He says, yes, I will be with the one who, s who freed me from my burden. You saw the picture last week, the big burden of his sin. I will be with the one who gave his life. To, to and then when his burden flew off, he received uh, a three angelic being came to him. And they removed his filthy clothes and they gave him a nice coat representing the righteousness. And they gave him a, a, a scroll. And uh, something else that I, I for, I'm forgetting there. So it, it's, a, it's all a symbolic of the new life that he has received and the, the directions and something to help him and, and, his, and his journey. But he removed his, his, old, his old coat and he, wa he was going there. So and then one of these response is that I'm, I want to go there because I want to be with the one who set me free because he died for me and also because he gave me this coat and he gave me this book 
and all of the things. And I want to be in the company of those who sing holy, holy, holy. I want to be there with him. So that, that the main things that I want to be with him. And, and that's something that is a bit frightening for me sometimes to think about. Am I really in love with Jesus? Am I really excited about how, uh, my, my, my hope, my goal, my, my eternity is, is, is focused on I want to be with Jesus because I love him so much? Because I'm so thankful to him? Sometimes I just forget about it. I take it for granted. It's like a couple who get married. And then when they get married, they say, I will promise that I will cherish you, I will love you, I will protect you, I will, I will be so nice to you, you know. And then they get married, he says, hmm, what? What did you say? What did you say? Where are you? Like, you're not paying attention to anything. So, so it's, it's what's happening in our, in our Christian life, and it is a journey, it's, 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 a, it's a process. So in the Church of Ephesians, they were becoming more about doing things than about uh, Jesus. So they thought maybe they had arrived because they were doing all the right things. And it's a danger for a church like Lighthouse. We're doing the right things. We're doing a lot of the right things in Lighthouse. But is it enough for you? Are you close to Jesus? Have you lost your first love? That is a personal question and also a corporate question. Here is the problem. When we get saved, we think that we arrived to our destination. This is it, we arrived. But we must continually press on. When we get stuck, it's often because we lose sight of the big picture, the sight of our destination. And that is really, really important. And Jesus gives us more illustrations about this in chapter seven. Chapter seven is a very rich thing. Besides the narrow road, and the, the narrow gate and the narrow road. If you just continue a little bit further, I think the next slide here, you will see that he continues talking about the, the, uh, after the prophets, the false prophets, he will talk about the trees and the fruits. And those who say, Lord, Lord, he says, not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom. So that's a warning based on that. Every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. There's two kinds of trees producing either good fruits that will produce more fruits or bad fruits that will be cut down. And look at the picture, will be thrown in the fire. So there's again a picture of our journey and of our life. Trees and fruits. It shows that the life of the Christian should bring change in the life and produce fruits for the glory of God. Is it what you see in your life? The second picture, you will see the next text, is two different kinds of builders. Anyone who hears and obeys this teaching of mine is a wise man who built his house on solid rock. It did not collapse because its foundation was on the rock. A foolish man who built his house on sand and its collapse was total. So I just shortened it for, for space. So you see these images are added to the one of the two roads. You have the two roads, you have the, the trees, the good tree, the bad tree, the good fruit, the bad fruit. You have the good builder, the wise builder, and the other builder, and two, two houses, and two results of the houses. If you click to the next point, you will see a progression. The two gates and roads express the start of the life of faith. The two trees illustrates the growth, the fruitfulness, the service, the, the participation, the, the focusing on Jesus, the walk with Jesus, it produced something. We are achieving something. And the two houses show the, the end of our life of faith. The end, when it, will it stand or will it collapse? The foundation will stand. It's the end when God will call everything into a judgment. And that is so much important. You know, according to a survey made in the US, people on the street were asked if they thought they were going to heaven. And most people are saying yes, they will go to heaven. And they have all sorts of crazy theories about how heaven is like, where heaven is, how you go to heaven. And I, I think I want to come back to that in the future, the future studies. So. But when you have the goal of heaven, it transforms your life. 
So if you if you say if, if, remember the 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 the, the two gate with the two signs to heaven to heaven, okay. So I, Jesus says only a few will find the gate and will walk the narrow path with a difficult one with difficult choices regarding Jesus and your commitment. Only a few will get there, but most many will choose the other one. And then we, we see here people seeing in the general population, it represents anybody in the world, thinking, yeah, yeah, good, I'm a good person, I'll go to heaven, yeah, yeah, I believe heaven exists, yes, heaven is like this, heaven is like that, yeah, yeah, there's no hell. You know, I talk with old people now in Quebec that are like, like from your country, that they, are, they used to be Catholic, they were taught the same thing, heaven and hell. They don't believe in hell anymore. They refuse to believe in hell. No, there's, there's no hell. Hell is happening right here, right now. There's a lot of confusion in the general population about the way to heaven and the way to hell. But Jesus is so clear. Jesus is so, so clear. People say, yes, we believe it to go in heaven, but their lives show that they are on the pathway to go to destruction. It's, it's a sad, it's a very sad fact. It's a very sad fact. But for you and, and I, there's something that we need to be like the Apostle Paul. And we, we finish with that in Philippians chapter 3. We need to press on. Paul says, I don't mean that I am exactly what God wants me to be. I have not yet reached that goal. But I continue trying to reach it and make it mine. That's what Christ Jesus wants me to do. It's the reason he made me is. If you look at different Bible versions, says, I have not reached the goal yet, but I press on. Or I follow on, even if there is suffering. That's what is uh, the, in the intention behind. I press on even if it's hard. I press on even if it's long. I press on even if it will require perseverance. I press on even if, you know, it comes against me. I press on even if I'm the only one. I press on because I haven't reached that goal yet, but I press on to go there. I, I keep on running and struggling to take hold of the prize. That's in another Bible version. And the last verse that we are going to look this morning. There's such a wonderful truth in that text here. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights or seek the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Set, this is the, from the King James. I look at many, many Bible versions. That's the one I prefer. Set your affections on things above, not on things on earth. Seek means desire, inquire, research, go after. That's what it means. Since you have been raised to a new life, since you have received that, now the realities of heaven, desire, inquire, go after these things. And the set your affection is also very important. Interest yourself. Concern yourself with. Love heavenly things. Study them. Let your hearts be entirely captivated by them. Now that you are converted to God, act. Act in reference to heavenly things. As you did before in reference to those of earth. I used to tell people, before I believed in Jesus, I lived for the devil. I, I live a radical life for the devil. When I became a Christian, I lived a radical life for Jesus. And actually, I think there is no other way to live your Christian life than to live it radically. To be radical for Jesus. To be totally sold out. To be fully committed to Him. There's no other way to live that, that Christian life. Before, you live for the devil. You think like this. You live in the world. You adopted the ways of the world. Now that you are raised from, with Christ, He has given you a new life. Shouldn't you see the things of heard in the same way? based on the new sights of eternity. That's what we are reading. Now that you are converted to God. Setting our sights on the reality of heaven means put heaven's priorities in daily practice in the choices that we do. Someone says, the Christian should not think of things as they appear in the natural, 
And what it means is it should not evaluate, it should not depend upon, it should not value, and it should not make decisions based on the things just as they appear on the natural, but in reference to their importance to God. Is that true? And to eternity. You, you have a lot of earthly things. We live in an earthly world. We make decisions every day. We go to work. We relate to people. Shouldn't we now evaluate, depend upon, value, make decisions about things and people and different th things that happen and reference to their importance to God and to eternity? Shouldn't we be like that? Yes. Yes. All heaven hope, all heaven hope reshapes all life. All heaven hopes reshape our life. It transforms us. The more passionate you will be about heaven, the more you will live the right life here. That's what it means. Someone says it in this way. Those who most believe in the heaven promise are most prepared for a life of significance now. And it is true. You will make decision based on what's important to God, based on eternity. You will make that decision. You will value. You will spend your money. You will relate to people. You will do your work. You, uh, your daily life will be totally different, live in a different way, because you, you, your, your sphere to measure, to make your right choice, What's important is what's important to God and what is important and the view of eternity. Seek these things that are above. Seek these things. Set your sights and set your affections. And the French Bible studies on Friday, we talked about affections. And I, I think this, this word here is very important to me. Because in closing, think about the affections. In Romans chapter 8 says those who live according to the flesh affection sets their affections to the things of the flesh. And then it says in the same text that the, the affections of the flesh leads to death. Okay? Second says those who live according to the spirit sets their affections on the things of the spirits and it brings like honor and peace and glory it brings good things. So the questions in closing, maybe you can stand at the same time, that will be our altar call, is please stand. In this quiet time, you want to know which road you're walking, you want to know what you need to do today. Where are your affections? What is it in the morning that preoccupies your mind first. Where is it that you spend a lot of your time every day? Where do you spend your money? Uh, what are you thinking about, like your plans, uh, your projections, your goal, your dreams? W what are they? What kind of music do you listen? And what, what kind of uh, uh, activities do you have? Uh, how do you choose your friend? What's your language like? Uh, what are you involved in? Set your affections on the things of the spirit or set your affections on the things of the flesh. It's easy. You just think simply about your daily life. You look at how your life starts. What's important? Do you start reading the news or do you read the Bible? The Bible is boring or the news are more interesting? Facebook is more important. Spending money. On what are you spending money? Are you, are you uh, cheap when it comes to mission and giving? And you are generous on yourself or for other things? Like, you, you just set your, your affections. Where, what, how do you start your day? How do you spend your time? Where is it? Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Set your affections on things above, not on things on the earth. Father, help us to do right what this text says, to realign our sights 
or seeking or, or striving or desire, the things that we want to research, the things that we want to go after, the things that we interest ourselves in, that we set our affection, it's important for us, we, we, we are interested, we are concerned with these things, we love these things, we study them, we spend time there, we are captivated by them. Lord, help us to reset, push the reset button this morning. Holy Spirit, push the reset button of our heart. Right now, right here. Yet today will be a turning point, a, a change, a, a, a going back, a restoration. That really, the realities of heaven, the things above, will be part of our earthly walk, our journey. We haven't got there yet, but Lord, we know that we have to press on on that narrow road, even though it's going to cost something, but it is worth because it is life. Thank you, Lord. Bless your church. Bless your word in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Praise God.